And then Jesus said, There once was a rich man, expensively dressed in the latest fashions, wasting his days in conspicuous consumption. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from scraps off the rich man's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. Then he died, this poor man, and was taken up by the angels to the lap of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell and in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus in his lap. And he called out, Father Abraham, mercy, have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue. I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you got the good things and Lazarus the bad things. It's not like that here. Here he's consoled and you are tormented. Besides, in all these matters, there is a huge chasm set between us so that no one can go from us to you even if he wanted to, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. The rich man said, Then let me ask you, Father, send him to my house, to the house of my father, where I have five brothers, so that he can tell them the score and warn them so they won't end up in this place of torment. And Abraham answered, They have Moses and the prophets, their Bible. To tell them the score, let them listen to them. I know, Father Abraham, he said, but they're not listening. If someone came back to them from the dead, they would surely change their ways. And Abraham replied, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convicted by someone who rises from the dead. And then, in another time, shortly thereafter, Jesus tells a parable about ten virgins, five of whom end up throughout the story, because of their negligence and their inattention, being locked out of the big banquet, with the banquet owner saying to them, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. And then Jesus tells a parable about the sheep and the goats, where the sheep are those who, when they serve the poor, were actually serving Him, serving God, doing the will of God. And the goats weren't serving the poor, and when they weren't serving the poor, they weren't serving others, they weren't loving God, they weren't serving God and being God to them. And that parable ends with this line, then they, the goats, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus told these parables. Eternal punishment. I do not know you. There is a huge chasm set between us so that no one can go from us to you, even if they wanted to, nor can anyone cross over from you to us. Why did Jesus tell these terribly unsettling parables? Judgment parables. Was it just to shake us up, but hey, don't really worry, I just wanted to wake you up. I'm not really talking about realities here. Why, when he was on the road in that final week before his death, dying on a cross, a deathbed kind of time where you say things to people that matter most about what matters most, Why did he tell these very hard-hitting stories? Parables that clearly speak of a point of no return, of being stuck in something that sure sounds like hell forever. The rich man in that parable I just read, he scrambled, tried to find a way out, tried to find some comfort in the midst of his suffering, But the parable clearly teaches, in its overall numinous sense, that you've passed that point. It's done. There's no way back. I had a dream last night. I don't even remember the details, but it was in that moment a point of no return, and I couldn't undo what was done. I was stuck. I mean, that's, if you've had that moment, hell.
So what do you do with this issue of eternal punishment of that definition of hell? Those are just stories, just parables. Jesus didn't mean them to be taken literally. You make that argument, then what about all the ones that you really do want to take literally, about the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son? And Jesus told these parables because they were the best, best way through which to convey the truth of God, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the hard, the hellish. There is an eternal significance that you need and I need and we need to consider in living our earthly lives. Now, I can understand why Rob Bell would write that book that he wrote and say what he was saying in that video, that promo video. He's selling a ton of books, eh? I should have been much more controversial with my book, and we'd have done the same. I get why he would go there. The nature of hell is confusing and difficult, and the question of who goes there and its exact temperature and the nature, nature of its eternality. I mean, there's just so much confusion around that topic and those issues. And I get his heart in wanting to emphasize that God is not primarily about punishment. God is about grace and love and light and truth. Hell in where he lives, south of the 49th parallel, is often used by certain more fundamentalistic Christian circles as a way of doing evangelism out into the community. Either you turn, folks, or you're going to burn, folks. Welcome to our church. Or it's something along with heaven that's so focused on, we're so focused on the other side that we lose our attention in terms of this side and what it means to live a good human life and follow God now and bring heaven on earth now. And that's true, too. I get Bell's powerful imaginative hope and dream that God is so loving and so powerful that through the mystery of pain and suffering and, bro suffering and brokenness and all of this, that God will eventually, because His love is unstoppable, so wide and long and deep and high, no one will be able to resist it. And so, at some point in the process of every human being, they're going to turn to God and give their life to God. And I've read all those Bible passages he quotes in his book that seem to point to a God that's saving everything. Jesus in Revelations, I'm making all things new. And this phrase, all things throughout the New Testament, seemingly that seems to be the God of the Bible that plans on taking the whole world that he so loves and making it new. Like many Christians, I want to believe in a, the theological doctrine of universalism, that God saves everyone and everything. I want it to be true, but there's this other voice in the Bible that I cannot ignore or brush away. Part of that voice, those parables I started with. So then I think that maybe, God, this is another one of your God things that we're foolish to try to nail down too tightly. <laughs>